So thanks everyone for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be in, in the room to be able to give you a bit of insights from, from what we're, where we're coming from and what we do. Uh, as Wolf mentioned, my name is Ben Stewart. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer at Expansive and one of the founders of the business, which we started back in 2009 in London. Uh, and, and originally the idea was to look at bridging the gap between finance and project development. And uh, that was sort of the original idea, which kind of went through a few iterations and, and died a sad death at a few occasions. And then uh, we ended up seeing an opportunity in the, in the carbon space to bring uh, technology and, and, and market infrastructure to, to a space that we thought was going to grow quite significantly. And, and we saw the voluntary carbon space as a, as a key place for us to play in and, and saw some pretty interesting uh, dynamics that were going on there, probably a decade earlier than, than the market has probably come to, to be there. So, but. Um, it's allowed us to get into a pretty good position. But what we do at Expansive is we, we provide an exchange platform for, for trading in the, in the carbon space, in particular the voluntary carbon space. Uh, but we also offer products across a, a broader suite of what we're calling the ESG commodities. So we also offer water products through our, through our platform, which is called H2OX. Uh, we also trade renewable energy certificates and, and other related products. And we're looking at launching uh, a lot more in the digital fuels space. So looking at how you value uh, the fuels complex more aligned with, with their carbon intensity and, and the impact that they have. So, um, yeah, as, as I mentioned, you know, the last first 10 years of the business was pretty hard going, but in the last couple of years, I think the thematic around ESG and how it's taken off and, and become sort of a social license to operate across the commercial world has really driven um, a lot more flow and a lot more business to our platform. And um, you know, we've, we've been lucky enough to, to enjoy some pretty good growth in that period. So. Um, looking forward to discussing that with you all further, and I'll uh, hand over to James. Uh, so uh, thank you, thank you, um, guys, for the invitation to speak to today, and uh, it's great to see so many people here to talk about a subject that is obviously very dear to our heart. Uh, Green Collar, uh, we don't think of ourselves as a carbon business. We're an investor and developer in environmental markets and have been doing that for uh, well over a decade now. And we started our... Um, business with a, it's a sort of interesting story. We, a lot of us had worked on the other side in policy or in finance uh, where there was an increasing desire to want to invest into ways to incentivise good land use planning, good land use choices, uh, things that would deliver soil carbon, restore um, farmland, etc. But the counterparties to take advantage of these market ideas just didn't exist at the time. And I was actually doing this in Africa, uh, where we're sort of working with lots of smallholders and trying to figure out how do you connect that to a market that's interested in buying a biodiversity outcome or a water quality outcome or a carbon outcome. And so we wanted to um, demonstrate that this can actually work. And so we set up the company, yeah, as I said, uh, over a decade ago, with the view to show that if you get the incentives right, there should be no reason that we think of any of the services that we produce on a farm different from the services we currently produce and get paid for, like food. And so over the last decade, we have uh, grown up a, a considerable footprint in the Australian landscape, particularly around carbon, but we've launched a water quality market in the Great Barrier Reef in the last, uh, well, it was an idea on paper five years ago, and today Wilf actually sits on the board of an independent market operator in Queensland and we have a functioning water quality market in North Queensland and along the Great Barrier Reef catchments for water quality improvements, so reduced nitrogen and um, reduced sediment. And we're doing the same thing in biodiversity and plastics. Always what we are most interested in, what we do is, how do we maximise value? Uh, there's a lot of conversation always, how do we reduce cost? I think it's the entirely wrong way to think about these markets that we're trying to evolve. We don't sit there and... Um, Immediately, the first question, and this is, I mean, it's systemic, I think, of, uh, and a systemic issue of a subject that has traditionally come out of the grant sector. It's like, well, we've only got so much money to spend, so how do we design something to spend that much money? And instead of saying, these services, we say there's a market failure, we say that we have a problem with Great Barrier Reef, we say we've got the problem with climate change, we've got to pay for the solution. And as land managers and people involved in land management, we're best placed to deliver that solution. But how much is it worth? Not, what's not the least cost that we can do it for, but how much is it actually worth? And so our, our big focus is finding that alignment with landholders. How do we actually get maximum value for the sorts of services that we can provide? And how do we expand that suite of options? And so like Ben very 
looking forward to having the conversation here today about um, what the future looks like for carbon and ESG and biodiversity plastics markets in general. Thanks, Ben and James. Um, the, the plan for today is really to have an interactive panel. There's a hundred people, I'm sure, a lot of questions. Um, I might just get the ball rolling though. The, I mean, the, the focus a little was on the opportunities in Australia um, to start with and will necessarily broaden to you know, international markets and the like. But I thought, first of all, given, um, you know, as George alluded to, sort of recent changes in Australia, it seemed worth getting from, from both of you sort of supply and demand views on, on the Australian carbon market. And I know Ben, sort of the international demand has taken off um, and indeed that, you know, the appetite for the supply. So perhaps there's a, an opener from me and then we might start to get the discussion going. If I could get your, your views on those supply and demand dynamics at the moment and the opportunities in Australian carbon. Um, yeah, so I think uh, on the supply and demand side, especially in Australia, we, we've seen a, a pretty interesting period. And this is a little bit um, as a result of markets that are really policy driven. So predominantly the markets we operate in are, are, are global markets that are not policy driven. The, the products are, are developed, but the drivers for who's buying them or how they're valued is a free market. So, um, you know, if, if a, a corporate wants to buy a particular product to meet a net zero target, they'll look at those products and, and they'll value them. And, and if they, they can meet the, the offer price that the seller wants to sell them for, that supply and demand dynamic will find its own way. I think in the Aussie market, especially with the ACCUs, um, you do have a little bit more of a policy driver around certain things that, that can influence the price of that market. But on the whole, I think it's a market that is, you know, seeing significant demand uh, and will continue to see significant demand. And I think that there's a big opportunity for a lot of innovation and a lot of new projects to come to light to, to help meet that demand. Um, and we are seeing that come from, from not just domestic buyers, we are seeing international buyers that do see the value in having something that's um, you know, sovereign backed by, by government as adding extra value. And, and as such, you know, you're sort of seeing the price of, of ACCUs, you know, it went up $8 this week on the back of a, on the back of a, the, uh, the labour win. Um, some products are now trading at $50, uh, and, and, but then the international equivalents are probably trading around the, the, the $9 to $15 range. So um, that's just a, a little dynamic there that, that's, that's coming through in the value of those markets. But um, you know, I think <clears throat> the demand seems very healthy and I think there's a lot of opportunity for, for more innovation and more products to come to light, especially from a, an Australian context. The, what's, what I find really interesting is that, particularly in these markets, we, sp we spend our you know, 24 hours a day thinking about this, right? We've got a problem that is this big and we've got a market as far as carbon goes that is maybe that, part of, that much part of the solution. And so as to the demand, the demand is ultimately overwhelming relative to the ability to meet the supply of what we can produce. And by extension, not just carbon, all these ecosystem services that we're talking about, water quality, biodiversity, habitat, plus food production, there's only more pressure every year as a result of changing climate and economic pressures, and these resources become scarcer to produce. So it's, you know, from a, being in the supply side space, we just see this as a space of enormous opportunity. And there will be no end of innovation as to how we look at taking advantages of those opportunities and delivering these services that we clearly need to deliver if we're going to solve any of these uh, existential threats that we face through climate change and um, habitat loss, biodiversity loss. The way in which we solve that will continue to evolve. So from a, you know, where we sit, we're interested in actually producing the, the product, which is a, an emissions reduction or a water quality uh, improvement first. Then we think about the policy environment second, because it will continue to evolve. As Ben said, it's, it's, it has been very government driven uh, to date in Australia, uh, you know, which was sort of a, a retrograde step in many respects from where we were a decade ago when we actually had a much more of a uh, free market with uh, the base uh, line and credit uh, mechanism that we previously had. Uh, so that will change. Uh, in the short term, uh, the demand for ACUs uh, is very, very strong. I think one of the challenges we face in understanding what's happening in that market, it still remains very illiquid. So whilst there are trades where you see price bouncing around like this, it's a fraction of the market. You're not really seeing that uh, underlying supply and demand dynamic. And from where we sit, we 
you know, our observations would be that the price has been more stable uh, than perhaps the um, short-term volatility that's reported suggests. And also, it remains very strong. So we are seeing pricing that people were forecasting for 2025, 2026 happening now. If you went back six months in time, no one uh, was forecasting that there would be carbon prices in March, February this year where you would be selling at 40 or $50. And that has, uh, that has come to fruition. And, and as, as Ben said, you know, particular products are continuing to sell at those prices. So you know, very healthy. Uh, it does um, mean that as there's much more participation in the market, much more scrutiny, so constants demand to respond to that scrutiny, demonstrate the integrity in the market, really, really important subject for everyone at the moment. So the incentives in this market is to stop me asking inane questions. So could I ask, um, Robert Hardy has a microphone. Um, thank you, Robert. Um, could I invite you to um, pick the brains of the two gentlemen here who've given great answers so far and um, look forward to the discussion. Thanks, guys. Uh, yeah, Marcus Kalbitzer, uh, Bridge Lane. Um, <clears throat> we've got a carbon project overseas, but um, one of the experiences in going through this is actually the measurement side of things. And, and today, measurement's done ground truth in soil sampling predominantly. And there are some other um, advancements in that area. But how do you guys see that playing out? Well, how, how do you guys see that today? And how do you see that playing out into the future in terms of cost of measuring um, the amount of carbon sequestration? Yeah, that's, that's a great, great question. Uh, and it, it goes a little bit back to um, my point before about value versus cost. So there's always a trade-off. And there's been a big focus historically, particularly in Australia, I'd say, in the last um, few years as we're trying to get soil carbon into the market. And one of the inhibitors on that has been the price of carbon because it's been down here and the cost of doing measurement effectively has been up here. And so whilst the price was suppressed for policy reasons, the other option was to go and look at, well, how can we reduce cost? It's a challenge. Um, and this is not just for soil, I'd say for all methods that uh, the desire to try and do it all remotely um, from uh, you know, using remote sensing imagery, etc., cetera, um, is a strong desire. But the reality is the technology is probably not there. And you know, we, do, we do this firsthand every day of the week. We are heavily invested in soil carbon in different ways. And we invested into AgriProve as an example. We've been running pilots and research programs uh, with various institutions, Australian government for over a decade. Uh, particularly on the remote ses sensing question and ground truthing data. There are ways to do it, but every time we do it, we give up something. And so when you are trying to do th things with cruder data, well, then you've got more uncertainty. And so the way you deal with uncertainty is becoming more conservative in your assessment, which is ultimately the solution if you've got a higher price. Uh, so not probably giving you a particularly satisfactory answer in the short term, but what I don't, the trap I don't think that we should be falling into is trying to avoid doing the measurement. Because if we avoid doing the measurement, we risk falling into that um, vacuum where we can't actually demonstrate the integrity of what we're doing. And if we're doing that, well, then the value goes out of the product entirely. And the um, greatest example of that was the Chicago um, Soil Exchange, where they had uh, decided we will go for ease of participation rather than accuracy of measurement. And they ended up with one cent credits that no one wanted. And basically that market collapsed. So uh, I think there is a, stuff like carbon count, et cetera, lots of innovation happening. And those costs will continue to come down. But we want to be focused on that value question because if you've got one credit worth 100 bucks, it's a hell of a lot better than having 10 credits worth nothing. Yeah, the market has definitely seen extra value in certain types of credits, certain types of products. I think <clears throat> one of the things that we've been able to do is commoditize what is very a difficult product to commoditize. Um, so, you know, traditionally, when you're buying in the voluntary carbon market, you were buying credits from a particular project. Um, what we were able to do about 18 months ago was find a way to commoditize that into a bucket. And so that, you know, if your project met certain criteria, it was eligibly traded into this, this market. And what that did was create a really good price signal for where value is and maintain a level of integrity around the underlying products that were being delivered. So, um, so, but 
that's not the way to solve the whole market because you have still got other elements that are valued in those products as well. So we have commoditized products on our platform, but we also allow cr projects to trade on their own rights as well. So if someone say the benchmarking of a forestry project is at $11, someone might have um, other co-benefits, indigenous benefits, biodiversity benefits that, that they want to see valued and the corporates will pay for that. Uh, and so we allow them to trade them in their own right against that actual project. So. So we do see people happy to pay, uh, and we do see um, uh, our platforms now in, in, our, in our exchange platform, but also the other ancillary products, the other ancillary infrastructure that's around that makes it easy to demonstrate those things. So, and you know, to James's point, I think that's a really key part of the market is, you know, when you mentioned the Chicago Climate Exchange, we actually studied that really closely around kind of a case study of what not to do. Um, because they were kind of judged jury and executioner. They were the creating the credits, they were selling the credits, they were telling people why they had to buy the credits, and they were doing everything. And, and that's a model that's always flawed because you know, you, you're, you're incentivised to see more volume. Keeping that independence is really key. And so you know, that's where we've got you know, independence in the verifiers, independence in the, in the people that are the project developers, and oversight over them is, is a key part of the market that I think is, is, is can, gonna be here and be part of it for a long time. And I think that's something that also allows you to demonstrate those extra values as well, because you can actually illustrate why one project is different from another. Thanks very much. Um, I'm Bill Herditch from MacDoc Ag Group. Um, thanks for those answers. I, we've done a bit of work in this uh, ourselves. And my question is really about the nature of the credits and where their destination is. This is like particularly soil, soil carbon credits, but other carbon. Um, Corporates, particularly uh, big producers, are increasingly getting pressure from their buyers to actually have lower carbon products themselves, whereas the Qantas's of this world and others are looking for offsets. Where's the, where's the equilibrium going to fall between offsets and insets? Uh, look, I think it's an interesting question. I think, <clears throat> you know, carbon is just one tool in the toolkit, right, to help get to net zero. Obviously, the key part of what carbon does is it gives you an ability to understand what the value is of what you're producing. So if you put a price on something, it actually, that's something that everyone from the lowest level of a company through to the top level can understand. So if you think that your carbon costs each year are $10 million, that's a big number that you want to try and reduce. And maybe if you're a big company, maybe it isn't. But if you tell someone that this, your carbon costs are 10 million tonnes, it's not really something that people can quantify and, and understand. And so putting a dollar value on it, it helps drive the rest of those efficiencies through the business because people understand that. They understand bottom line effects. And so that carbon becomes a key part of helping that be understood and having a carbon market through the carbon credit product um, is, has been found to be the most efficient way to do that. Uh, but the, the other part you're missing around the carbon credit side is Buying carbon credits isn't just you know, sort of pushing it off. It's an investment in a project. You're actually investing in new technology. You're investing in something that's actually changing what is the norm. You know, you're investing someone to do something different. You know, that's, that's the key. And without that investment, a lot of those projects won't get off the ground. So it's a, it's a mechanism by which value is transferred to the project so that it can actually be built and be done. Because without that carbon asset, a lot of these projects wouldn't get off the ground. You know, letting mulga grow out in southwest Queensland would be no good to anyone unless, you know, the, having the carbon asset there is why those projects are now being regenerating and they're starting to grow plant, permanent plantings. Other things are starting to, you know, that, that carbon aspect is the only reason why they're, they're getting off the ground and they are helping to, to, to create that change, so. Really great question. And I, um, just picking up on the tail end of Ben's comments, uh, take a step back for a moment. The offset and inset, um, as either of those ideas, take us a little bit away from why we were even trying to do this in the first place, which was, we say there's a market failure, which is we haven't put a price on the cost of carbon emissions. And if we had had an emissions trading scheme a decade ago here, we probably wouldn't be having a debate about offsetting or not offsetting. Because the, the, the idea was there's a whole economy here and across that economy there are things that we need to do. One of the things that we need to do is get out of coal, fossil fuel emissions and move over to renewable energy. Another one of the things that we need to do is slow the rate of vegetation loss and improve soil carbon. We need to do all of these things if we're going to get anywhere near actually solving the problem. And so each of those things comes at a different price and if we've got an efficient market working, we start to buy up that cost curve. Uh, 
we didn't have a market a decade ago and now we're in a different situation and we've got to do, we've got to come at the problem faster and harder and we've got to try different things. Uh, the market is part of that solution. Uh, direct intervention is part of that solution. Uh, and finding other ways to put value on those benefits is part of that solution, which brings you around to the insetting question and how does that actually relate to who's buying the, the credits? What's their hierarchy of well, their pathway to uh, being net zero or hopefully carbon positive, avoidance first, mitigation second, and then after that, offsetting as a solution, which is effectively saying, well, we can't go any further at the moment, but we're going to help someone else on their journey. What's interesting, I think, about the, the land sector is that you've probably got a lot more potential to solve other people's problems once you've solved your own. So if you've got a, you know, a pastoral estate or a grain operation, you'll be able to offset your emissions through an insetting product and sort of value add your product that comes off the farm probably with that much. But then you've got this extra benefit that you can deliver. And I think this is sort of the, the question where this journey ends up is that what am I using for the value adding of my other products that come off the farm versus what am I selling discreetly to those that need a particular service. And one of the philosophical um, drivers for us on this is that we want to explicitly pr price each of these different services. We don't just want to bundle it all up into a sort of carbon credit plus with some nice other stuff on the side and sell it for a $2 premium. If somebody wants water quality, you want to say, who's prepared to pay the most for water quality outcome? If somebody's particularly interested in biodiversity, who's prepared to may pay the most for that biodiversity benefit? It's really important because there's one thing that anyone that's running an agricultural enterprise in this room will know is that the best way to get a better land management outcome is more money through the farm gate. If you've got more profitable farms, you have better conservation outcomes at the end of the day. And that's where we need to end up. Uh, Robert Hardy from the Farm Riders Committee. Um, George mentioned before the changing political dynamic in the last week, and certainly you've both referred to what happened a decade ago. How do we prevent this argument around um, you can't be green if you're in the red, to the point you just made then around profitability on farms? How do we prevent th this from becoming a political issue again and being re-prosecuted in the same quite negative fashion as it was a decade ago? But equally, how do we make sure that um, my, my word, do-gooders in marketing departments in some of these places like Coles and Woolies and, and other businesses that might be buying carbon credits don't then suddenly decide that they're going to start telling farmers how they're going to produce their product. So um, one of the issues that somebody who's been you know, part of the industry discussions around ma managing this sort of stuff is um, a question of, of control. Yes, you're paying for it, but he who pays the piper plays the tune. So how do we prevent, how do we make sure farmers maintain control over the way they they produce their product and it's not being dictated to them by um, um, shiny bottom marketing gurus who sit in capital cities? Yeah. That's a fantastic question. And <laughs> uh, if you don't mind, I'll take it. For, I mean, again, <laughs> one that we think about a lot too. And uh, yeah, it also enters into this risk of greenwashing space as well, that question, right? Because people um, maybe want to, you know, do this much and then claim they've done that much. See the problem with Mark? Handheld microphones and gesticulating. <laughs> There's a lectern there. I'm sure Wilf won't, <laughs> Wilf won't mind if you share it. Um, so how do we stop it? I, I mean, I don't think it's with anyone's power to completely change the nature of the political environment. It's very difficult. But I do think we have a very powerful moment here. And we've got... What's interesting about the parliament we've just got is that Labor's only just getting to a majority. So there's a big sector there on the crossbench that is particularly interested in existentially the issues that you just described. They want to see real action, but they also want to see strong market-based and uh, economically rational policies to get there. So I think there's a really interesting opportunity here in that moment in time to try and set some of those parameters uh, and get the, sorry, set those parameters in the right way that they are lasting and forge more of a consensus. I also think it's interesting that um, whilst They've retained, so if there, you say there was a swing against um, the previous government, but the rural space um, appeared not to change you know, substantially politically, I don't think that's really true. 
I think that there is more and more change happening out in the um, rural sector than we probably realise. You can go out to Western New South Wales, you can go out to Western Cobar and these guys, sorry, uh, Western Queensland, and these guys are more informed on climate and carbon than anyone would ever give them credit for. Uh, they don't necessarily have a consensus view, and I think the politics is slow in catching up to that, and they will get there. <laughs> they will get there. And so the political issue then, as we get more consensus, becomes less of an issue and it now becomes more of a contest of what's the best way to do this? And that's where we need to keep pushing the conversation. What's the best way to do it? Buyers will set terms. Uh, buyers already set terms for how they want to do things. Uh, where you're on the other side of that equation is you can also lead. Buyers also respond to people that are leading. And so if you're in the forefront of producing the product, and this, that's, that's just the rule of markets, right? It's not, it's not special to climate, but we need to get into a space where we have those normal rules operating and it's not about the politics. And I think what's special about right now is we've shown that it, it shouldn't be about the politics. And we've got a you know, pretty broad church now uh, from, what, 76 through to what, 16 independents broad church of sol people that are interested in different solutions, but all passionate about the fact we actually need to just get on and solve this problem. Yeah, I think our view on the, on the whole political side of things is that we have, as a business, have deliberately avoided anything that had to do with, with government um, solutions around our, our market mechanism, because you know, our view is they don't have a place. Um, it shouldn't be up to the government to tell you how a market works. And there's plenty of times where you've seen that where it, it's not good, it doesn't work. So we, by actual design, stayed in a market that was purely devoid of any government regulation in terms of telling people what they had to buy or why they had to buy it. Um, now, that took a long time to get consensus in that market and we spent, we've spent 12 years building it and in the last two years it's really taken off. But the market that we operate in is, is, is driven by corporates, it's driven by shareholders, it's driven by finances, it's driven by the economy more broadly, not government saying you've got certain levels. And in our view, that's a far stronger market mechanism than, than one where strokes of pens can change the price. Because those markets where policy changes will, will have an influence on the price doesn't bring the liquidity providers in because you know, there, there's risk. You know, those changes could go adversely against them when there's significant risk. And we saw that here in Australia in, in the ACCU market to an extent recently where the, a change of policy caused a, a, a big drop. Now, that could have also been as a result of, you know, timing of the economy and slowing down and interest rates and a whole other lot of things. But, you know, that, that was what the, uh, the blame was fairly squarely put on it as, is that that was the, the reason behind it. So, um, so yeah, from so our point of view, we'd be, we'd be very happy if government continued to stay out of it and never got involved um, and let the free markets and, and let things like you know, the SEC regulations in the US where they've just come out and said any company that wants to make a claim has to prove it and they're going to set standards by which they have to prove and they've got to show what they've bought and they've got to show how they've measured and what they've done and they're going to start benchmarking that. That's going to be a far bigger driver because if you're then benchmarked directly against your competitor, shareholders are going to choose which one they're going to go based on those, those metrics. And that's going to make change happen far quicker than government regulation in our view. And so that's the sort of market we've, we've been aiming at. And so hopefully the, um, you know, the government continues to stay out of the global market because I think it's getting there by itself. Bill Fogel from Baker McKenzie. Um, you mentioned earlier about the cost of verification versus the um, value of the actual credits themselves. If you were um, running a voluntary uh, carbon exchange or similar, what would, and I know this is a, a very specific and perhaps we don't know the answer to this, but what would be a reasonable cost of verification, sort of, you know, on a credit per year sort of a basis? You know, what's if you want to protect your reputation, you want to make sure that you've got verified credits, what's a reasonable cost to impose on that or to expect people to pay for that verification? We're, we are peculiar even amongst our industry peers in that we have a strong view that more audit, more rigour, more interrogation, more transaction cost adds value. And it's, it's unique to these sorts of products because they are, in some respects, uh, the service is real. Yes, there's carbon removed from the environment or there's uh, a biodiversity benefit, but our way of understanding it requires a level of accounting that is a little bit abstract. And so it needs scrutiny, it needs rigour and it needs transparency.
for people to believe in it. And so I think it's a little bit difficult to say what that cost should be because the cost for a soil carbon project versus the cost for a um, plantings project versus the cost for a land clearing project, they'll all be different to get to that same level of assurance. So the better a way of thinking is what's the cost relative to that project to get to what level of assurance that we, we are seeking? Do we want to get within 5% of what we are saying? Do we want to be within 10? Do we want to be within 20% of it? And if we're within 20% of it, how do we mitigate that uncertainty? So what are the ways that we deal with it? So there's a lot to it. We are under, and p people may or may not realise just how much audit is already built into the ACU market. We are under audit every day of the year in Green Collar. Every single day of the year we have auditors in our offices or out in properties looking at the projects that we do. We do hundreds and hundreds of audits and they're not audits with you know, the same random guy. They're audits with EY and PwC, Debt Norse Veritas, all kinds of different audit firms <laughs> constantly looking at this subject. Uh, and they're charging market rates and all that does is bring value because the more the cost of audit increases, our prices reflect that, the higher the value of the, the credit that we're ultimately selling. And right now is a great test of that, right? Because if you're not able to, in the face of a lot of criticism, turn around and actually defend what you're doing, you're in trouble. Um, so not everyone's interested. Everyone, will, some, plenty of buyers will be happy to to rest on that assurance. But one in ten is going to come and say, "Well, show me, show me the data. Show me how you actually did this." And you've got to have done it. So I, for me, you can't place enough value on that process uh, without being able to say what that actual dollar figure is, because it's vastly different from soil carbon to vegetation to you know, we do water quality. We do biodiversity surveys. So some of the biodiversity assurance work that we do is in the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars at the property level. Uh, the, to your questions earlier over here, the market responds to that too. So uh, again, going back to that, the point, the demand vastly outstripping the supply and the fact that, you know, it's sort of one of the general themes here is industry is ahead of government on this, not just in Australia's globally. Industry is well ahead of this. Um, maybe not as far ahead as we would like, but they're certainly ahead of where government policy generally is. And they are getting better. Again, don't misunderstand me here. There's a long way to go. But they are getting better. And we should be encouraging that and encouraging more of it. And that, in many respects, is also driven by consumer demand. Because the consumers of the products that these corporates are selling want the same assurance that you're talking about. So as that happens, you get diversification, you will get products that are able to show with a higher level of certainty that something's happened than other products. That differentiates, you get differential pricing in response to that. That'll be reflected on Ben's exchange. Uh, and we will continue to be able to justify really, really high water costs because that is all about the integrity that sits in the market. Yeah, not a lot to add, but I think, yeah, just echoing James's point around <coughs> that integrity is key. I think that's, you know, it, it only takes one bad episode or one thing to go wrong and it brings down a whole decade of work that's got it to a point where there's a lot of um, you know uh, acceptance and, and and trust and resilience in the products that are being traded out there and so um, yeah I think that that independence and that audit work is 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 a key part and I think yeah it, it needs to keep it needs to evolve with the market but I think if you look at it as a percentage of them of the cost of the credits you know we we started trading our standardized contract on on uh, carbon offsets in uh, of October of 2020, that that product launched at 72 cents and it went to nine dollars. So and the audit costs, uh, you know, might have gone up a little bit in between that, but nowhere near as a percentage of the market. So the audit costs as a percentage of the value of the credits is definitely coming down um, because the market is starting to respond because those products are really um, high value and have a lot of trust and people are really valuing that that certainty they get when they deal in those sorts of products. Sam Hull from Syngenta. Um, firstly, I, I, uh, I feel like a year seven kid in a postgrad lecture a little bit here, so my question <coughs> might be simple. Um, secondly, I work for a, a company that doesn't really want to become the Kodak of the ag, chem and seeds <laughs> industry either, so we're, we're um, investing in, in carbon particularly, but I feel it's a bit blind at times. It's a bit like exploring the universe. So 
I'm interested from an Australian perspective. Do, do we, as a, as a, you know, on the oldest and driest soils, although it probably doesn't feel like the driest at the moment, um, in in all farming continents, do we have an advantage in the global carbon market, uh, particularly when it comes to agriculture? Is that a is it an advantage, or, or is there a disadvantage? How, how would we compete uh, globally? And maybe there's a few factors. I've got a view. I'm sure James will be able to elaborate on it. But um, <clears throat> look, I think we do. We, we have an abundant resource there in lots of land. So that's that's one advantage. If you think about a lot of European places, that's not available readily to a lot of people. So that, that is one, one definite advantage. Um, I think we have the most innovative farmers in the world. So that is a, you know, another advantage and willing to try things and be, you know, they're practically the sandbox of, of, of any innovation in this country it starts with the, the farmers. They're willing to give most things a go and, and try them. So I think that's that's another advantage that we've got. Um, but, you know, look, I think we, we have advantages in some areas and I think, you know, we are finding those methodologies and through the work of like Green Collar and others, you're seeing those methodologies being honed for the Australian conditions more, more you know, suitably to meet those markets. So, you know, do we have a bigger advantage than, say, Canada or other places than, you know, probably if you look at permanent plantings, probably not. It's probably a wetter environment. You're gonna, probably going to grow more forests up there more quickly. But, you know, do they have regeneration projects like we do here? Possibly not. So, so you know, I wouldn't say we're, we're necessarily um, more advantaged on, a, on, a, on the basis of, of, the, of the types. We're just, we're just being able to evolve the types of projects to meet our, our conditions. And I think you know we have a, a huge resource out there in a, in a very big landmass that I think is, a, is gives us a really good opportunity. So I don't have too much to add to that. Uh, we do have plenty of land, absolutely, and uh, a lot of that land could be in better condition. And so, and that's really the real question because it's about you know if there's an opportunity to take advantage, you've got to have a baseline that you can improve upon. So that would be the, the first point, that the, there's plenty of land out there and there's plenty of stuff that we could be doing better. That's not to say everything we're doing is bad, by the way. There's a lot of great stuff that we're doing and even great stuff can be better. And I think that's a, um, a trap we often fall into. We sort of turn these things into black and white ideas. That's good, this is bad. And there's a continuum and you know, I, I get asked this question a lot in the circles I move in, you could imagine. I talk about food production a lot. There's this idea, this sort of food is bad, this sort of food is good. And my answer to that is we can produce all food in a way that has positive environmental impact and we can produce most of that sort of food in a way that has a pretty negative environmental impact. And it's finding the ways to optimise both. So I think we have a huge potential in Australia because we do have a sophisticated ag sector to be able to take advantage of those ideas and do those things. We do have the, the inherent constraint that we have low rainfall across most of the country. I've had four and a half years of rain on my place in the last two years, by the way, which is just nuts, not normal. Uh, but generally we're very dry uh, and that just is an inherent sort of limiting factor. So there's not an in infinite amount of carbon that you can create in the land sector. It, it's finite. I don't know what that number is, but it's finite. And to sort of Ben's point, you know, different uh, ecosystems are going to lead towards different kinds of activities. Soils is a is a really interesting one. There's a theoretical huge potential, but uh, at per hectare, if you look at it sort of at the per hectare level, it's small. And so how do you find those economies of scale and how can you actually deliver a land use change across a million hectares that takes advantage of that economy of scale? They're harder, harder problems to come out. Um, James, Scott Bouvier at KWM. Another um, constraint type question is really the skills to actually deliver these projects. So in your business, if you were to scale that up 10, 20, 30 times to meet the potential product projects we need to do, do you have the graduates, the young scientists, the economists there? Are they coming from our universities to help support what we need to be doing on that front? Oh, that's a fantastic. I like these questions. Is it <laughs> wide ranging questions for a change. That's another one we think about a lot. And a, a conversation we often have at work is, particularly with some of the younger guys, is um, who can I go and speak to about this thing? And a lot of the times the conversation has to be, well, you know what? You're actually doing this for the first time. There's a lot of people that know about this subject generally and there's a lot of adjacent skill sets, but there's not a lot of people that have done the thing that you're doing right now. And I, I love that because it's a really exciting space to be in. 
Uh, but there's less people out there than you might think. But there's plenty of graduates that want to move into this sector. And I think we have a lot of uh, great talent coming through at that level. We do lack at sort of the 10, 20 year experience level. It's a, it's a pretty small gene pool some of the times. <laughs> um, which is not to discredit the quality of the genes in that gene pool. Or, or anyone else that may have fallen out of my gross generalisation there. Uh, but there just hasn't been a lot of people applying this stuff for a decade. You know, we've got two or three competitors in this country that have been doing carbon projects consistently at a decent scale for more than five years. That's not a lot. So we get asked the question, oh, well, you guys are the only ones saying that this thing here is a problem. So well, there's only three of us that are actually trying to do it. So it, it, it's, a, it's a challenge, but huge opportunity. And what I love about what we do at the moment is we just have such a wealth of talent that wants to come and work with us. And we're very lucky and privileged to be in that space because people want to be working in this sector. And it's, you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, I think we think of environmental markets. We won't think of it as particularly distinct from agriculture. And it will be much more the giant big sector that today, say, the oil and gas industry is or the tech sector is, and we'll start thinking about it in the same way. So I, I just think this is a huge opportunity for the ag sector in general to sort of, you know, again, it's a biased room, right? But a lot of people sort of outside the ag sector say, oh, it's really hard to invest in agriculture. It's the most ridiculous thing. I mean, it's absurd. It's like, the one thing humans need the most, <laughs> besides the roof over the head, food. How can the ag sector be one of the hardest sectors to invest in? It's the commodity that we need the absolute most. So, sorry, that's a long-winded answer to that question. Sort of a bit of a yes and a bit of no, column A, column B. Yeah, I'll just add to that. I mean, yeah, pe finding resources is, is really difficult. You know, finding resources that, um, that understand the space is even more difficult. So, um, but yeah, to James's point, there's a real centre of gravity happening around this area at the moment where we're attracting you know, amazing talented people out of straight out of university and which is great from our point of view because you, you, they're coming in without any any existing biases or any issues that they might have brought from a previous job and so we've, we've actually been really successful in, in bringing them graduates through and it's been a, a huge uh, huge bonus for us to get those sorts of people in. Thank you both very much for your time today and indeed James you made this point um, thank you both for your perseverance you know sort of what are we, eight, almost eight years to the day since the repeal of the carbon price? It wasn't a tax, it was a price. Um, and you guys kept soldiering on and I think we're all better for your businesses doing so, so thank you. Um, would you please join me in giving Ben and James a big round of applause? Thank you. Thank you.